Good morning, everybody. We are ready to continue on in our earliest American study. I'm going to do a quick review about what we've learned so far in the first four chapters. We started out talking about the cross from Beringia. So how they came from the continent of Asia to the continent of North America across this land bridge. And they were able to cross that land bridge because the ice age was occurring. And during the ice age, there were large amounts of ocean water um, frozen into big sheets of ice. So that meant the levels of the ocean were much lower and that land was visible and able to be crossed. It is no longer visible. It is now called the Bering Strait. And it is water. And those were the people of Beringia. Um, they moved back and forth across that land bridge. One of the reasons that they did that is because they were chasing wild game. And one of the large animals that they liked to hunt was the woolly mammoth. A woolly mammoth is a large furry elephant, basically. It's like an elephant. As we moved ahead in our studies, we talked about how the after they crossed that bridge, they were now in North America. And as the ice age began to recede and the huge sheets of ice started to melt, the levels of the ocean rose and that made this land bridge disappear. So they were no longer able to walk across that land bridge. Um, when the climate became warmer, the lakes in North America filled up and those, uh, the Great Lakes we call there is an acronym that you can help you remember, and it's called HOMES. H is for Huron. I don't know if you can see it. <clears throat> o is Ontario. M is Michigan. E is Erie. And S is Superior. H-O-M-E-S. If you remember that, H-O-M-E-S, you will remember that. Okay, those five lakes start with those letters, and you should be able to remember them. But as the climate warmed up, the Great Lakes filled. And it cut the United, I mean, it cut North America, Alaska and Canada. It cut them off from Asia. And the, as the climate continued to change, many of the large animals that they, they were hunting disappeared. And as that happened, then they had to learn other skills. And one of the skills that they learned from the people of Mexico is how to grow corn. As we continued on in our study of the earliest Americans, we moved into the Inuit. Some people call them Eskimos. They are, they are the same people, but they choose to call themselves Inuit. They're ancestors of the Arctic people is what they are. They are ancestors of what are currently the Arctic people. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. And this is lights that are caused by a reflection of sunlight. And you can only see them. Um, well, I need my other map. You can only see them in the far north, in the far north. We learned that the Inuit people lived in temporary shelters called igloos when they were traveling, when they were hunting. But they also had... Um, permanent shelters, tents that they lived in in the summers. And they hunted caribou, fish, walrus, seals, that sort of thing, any kind of sea animal. And the caribou, which were, which are kind of like deer, and they live in the far north. We also learned that the Inuit traveled by canoe or sled. And the Inuit were probably the people that we learned about in the Vikings in our last unit where Eric the Red, I believe, or else it was Leif Eric, and I can't remember which Erickson it was, said that he saw strange people in canoes, which were the kayaks. They came to Greenland and they traded with them. Uh, in the last chapter, which was chapter four, we talked about the ancestral Pueblo and the mound builders. The ancestral Pueblo lived in cliffs. We talked about how they lived in the cliffs and they lived in this area right here, the four corners of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, what is now the United States. We have no idea what happened to the ancestral Pueblo. They just disappeared and there's no archeological records to tell us what actually happened to them. The other group that we talked about was the mound builders. The mound builders used piles of dirt to build mounds. That's what they did. 
And so they would get bucket full after bucket full after bucket full of dirt, and they would build these huge mounds. They would flatten them off on the top, and that's where they would put their homes and their centers of worship and their storage areas and all of that. The mound builders, we learned, died from diseases that were carried by the Europeans, specifically the Spanish, as they came to the United States. The survivors of the mound builders, we call them the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Cherokee. Those are the three groups who consider themselves survivors or descendants of the mound builders. Yesterday, we talked about some specific groups of people. We talked about the Hobi, which means peaceful people. And they lived in the desert area of Arizona, right about here. They built villages on high mesas, so similar to the mound builders. We also learned about the Zuni. The Zuni are also, they call them, the Zuni means um, Pueblo people. Pueblo people, that's what it means, Pueblo people. So they lived in western New Mexico, so around here, in this area of the world. The Navajo was another group that we talked about. They migrated from northern Canada, and the Pueblo people taught them how to survive in the harsh climate of the high desert. When the Navajo, when, when the Spanish were introduced to the Navajo, the Spanish brought them sheep. And that dramatically changed the life of the Navajo. So that's happened. This happened in the 16, sometime in the 1600s, where the Spanish brought sheep over to the United States, introduced them to the Navajo, who then became sheep herders and farmers. They used the fleece to weave beautiful blankets and rugs. And that was something that we did yesterday. You turned in your rug design for a Navajo rug. That's what you did yesterday for. Agreed. The Navajo are the largest group of Native Americans that are living in the United States today. They are the largest group. Uh, the other group that we talked about were the Apache. They were fierce warriors, fierce warriors. They also migrated from northern Canada and they lived in what is present day Texas and New Mexico. And a little bit of Arizona. So like this area, and then also Northern Mexico. So right around here, they had a, a, a large area where they lived. They hunted and they traded. So unlike the Vikings who were traders and raiders, these guys were traders and hunters, <laughs> traders and hunters. What changed their way of life dramatically was when the Spanish brought horses to the United States. The Apache learned how to ride these horses and as a sort of twist of fate, they used these horses to raid the Spanish for forts. So they used the horses against the Spanish, but they also used them to raid Navajo villages. The Navajo and the Apache were enemies. So the Navajo, I mean, the Apache used the horses to raise the, to raid the Navajo villages and the Apache live in, it, still live in the United States today. The Comanche, that's our final group that we talked about. They were the only group of Native Americans that were more powerful than the Apache. So they gained the Apache land and they pushed, kept pushing them west. And this forced the Apache to do what we now call bury the hatchet. And what that means is to make peace with your enemies. I mean, to lay down your weapons and live at peace with your enemies. That's what it is. So the Apaches and the Europeans buried the hatchet, meaning that the Apaches were under the impression that the Europeans were going to live at peace with them. We will find out later that that did not actually happen, but that was the general idea. And so to bury a hatchet, bury the hatchet means to lay down your weapons and agree to stop fighting or agree to live at peace with your enemies. So, okay, that's what we learned so far. Today, we're gonna continue on. Um, we're gonna be in chapter six, but first I have a little bit of background information that I'm going to read to you about, um, about mound builders mostly is what we're talking about. Yeah, the mound builders. So the Southeast Native American culture region makes up what is today the Southeastern United States. This is the area that we're gonna be talking about today. So from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, North and South Carolina. So this area right here, like a windshield wiper. That's the area we're gonna be talking about today. 
two tribes in the southeast were the Cherokee and the Seminole. The Seminole people were primarily hunters and fishers. They lived in houses made of poles with thatched roofs. The Seminole dress was very distinctive with colorful strips of cloth, which may have been influenced by the textiles of the Spanish colonists who settled in the Seminole area of Florida. The Seminole tribe was a mix of many, many people, including Native Americans from different tribes and even some runaway slaves. The Cherokee farmed, hunted small game, fished, and gathered nuts and berries. The crops, were the crops that they raised were corn, beans, squash, and sunflowers. The Cherokee were excellent farmers, and they shared much of their agricultural knowledge with the European colonists who settled in the area. During the winter, the Cherokee people typically lived in houses made of logs or canes with bark roof. And in the summer, they lived in houses made of poles covered with grass or mud because it would be cooler then. Their clothes were made of animal skins, and they were known for their pottery and their woven baskets. The green corn ceremony held annually after the harvest was an important part of the religious ritual. They cleaned their houses, lit new fires, and they doused the old ones, and they settled their arguments. The Seminole and Cherokee were part of the five civilized nations, also known as the five civilized tribes, who were forced by the United States government to leave their land in the 1830s. Many of them live what is in now today the state of Oklahoma. And many of you already know that that forced removal of those five civilized tribes was called the Trail of Tears because that was the route that they took from their homeland to Oklahoma, where they now reside. The Cherokee, they tried to fit into the European American conception of what Native Americans should be. So they converted to Christianity. They became excellent farmers. They even wrote a constitution. The Cherokee recognized themselves as a sovereign nation, and they lost their land to the European American settlers. They were forced to march to the Oklahoma Territory in the Trail of Tears. Over 4,000 Cherokee died on that, on that march. About 95,000 of them live in what is today Oklahoma. The Seminole lost land in Florida to the white settlers after years of fighting with them, and they were also forced to move to Oklahoma. Currently, about 4,000 of them live in Oklahoma, and a much, much smaller number live in uh, Flor still live in Florida. Okay, let's go ahead and open up our earliest American readers. Today, we are going to be in Chapter 6 which if you're following along in the physical copy of the book, begins on page 38. And if you're following along in the PDF file, the title of the chapter is After the Mound Builders, The Creek Nation. As you know, the Mound Builders way of life ended in the 15 and 1600s. This happened when the Europeans and the germs they carried spread through what is now the Southern United States. Mound builder survivors probably joined other Native American groups in this region who lived in villages and small towns. Some of these groups became the Creek Confederacy along the Mississippi River. A confederacy is a loosely organized group of states or tribes. The Creek Nation formed after the mound builder culture broke up sometime before the 1600s. Creek communities were a lot like mound builder communities. And here is a picture of a sham, shaman doing a ceremony, and this is a Creek community. The Creek kept parts of the mound builder culture. Creek towns had a plaza for ceremonies and games, and they had a house where their council met. A council is a group of people who meet to help run the government. The chief and the assistant chief lived on the plaza. Most members of the Creek Confederacy spoke the same language. They held the same religious ceremonies. When a town got too big, part of the group would split off and start a new town nearby. In this way, the Creek were able to spread into North and South Carolina. That's what we're talking about today. North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. So just like this. Creek towns and villages were well-planned. Cattle, hogs, and other livestock were 
kept in fenced areas. Corn and potatoes were grown on farmland between the villages. Here is a picture of a creek settlement. The Seminole, that's another group that we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to talk about the Cherokee, and I think that's it. Yes, those three groups. Members of the Seminole Nation also descended from the mound builders. They live in present-day Florida and Oklahoma. And they only live in Oklahoma because they were forced there by the American government after they were forced out of Florida. And some of them still live in Florida, but not very many. Every Seminole is a member of one of eight clans or family groups. These clans are named Bear. <laughs> okay, it's Monday morning. Bear, deer, wind, big town, bird, snake, otter, and panther. The panther clan is the largest. Members of the animal clans believe that they are related to, related to these animals. They believe these animals' ancestors taught their clan how to live. People belong to their mother's clans, not their father's. A clan is a group of families claiming a common ancestor. So my clan is, on my dad's side would be the Roby clan, and on my mom's side would be the Kanzen clan. And you're thinking, wait, aren't you a Campbell? I am, but I married into my husband's family. And that's the Campbell clan. However, we belong to our mother's clan, so I would continue to belong to the Kansan clan, to my mother's clan. The Cherokee are another southeastern people descended from the mound builders. Their homeland was in western North Carolina. So here, eastern Tennessee and northern Georgia, this area right here. Some Cherokee still live there today. Sadly, most of the Cherokee and many Seminoles were forced to move from their homeland to what is now Oklahoma. Like other southeastern Native Americans, the Cherokee lived in small communities on good farming land. They built wood frame houses with walls made of woven vines or branches plastered with mud. Each village had a central building or council house for celebrations, ceremonies, and meetings. This council house had seven sides. Each side represented one of the Cherokee clans. And you're going, wait, weren't there eight? Yes, there were eight clans of the Seminole. We're now talking about the Cherokee. All right. The Cherokee clans, there were only seven. And these clans were the bird, paint, deer, wolf, blue, long hair, and wild potato. The Cherokee lived in small farming communities, and here's a picture of their small farming community. Each group of Cherokee had two chiefs. One chief ruled during peacetime, and the other chief ruled during war. The chiefs helped to guide the people and to make decisions, but the chiefs did not have complete control over the people. The people had a say in how they were ruled. Like all other Native American people, the Cherokee told many legends. These legends explained how their world had come into being and how people should live. In the late, 19, late 1700s and early 1800s, the Cherokee became the only Native American people in the United States who also kept written records. That is a key point. The Cherokee are the only Native American people to keep written records. And this is because of a certain man. Let's read about him now. Sequoia. The written language of the Cherokee was created by a man named Sequoia. He was born in 1770s in Tennessee. Sequoia became interested in books and letters, which he had seen written in English. He invented a set of symbols for the Cherokee language. A symbol is a picture or an object that is a sign for something else. For example, the American flag is a symbol for the United States. This allowed the Cherokee language to be written and to be read. Here is the Cherokee language. Let me make sure you can see that. And the symbols that Sequoia came up with. 
to represent their language. That's the Cherokee alphabet. All right. That wasn't much, right? I have a picture I'm going to show you. Actually, I think I put it in Bright Thinker already. You can look at that picture in Bright Thinker and answer some questions about it. I will review it quickly, but first we're going to review what we have read today. Um, every Seminole is a member of one of eight clans. Remember the eight clans named mostly after different animals, such as bear, deer, and panther. What do the Seminoles believe about the names of their clan? What do they believe about that? That's right. Members of each one of those clans believe that they're related to their particular animal after which their clan is named. And they also believe that these animals taught their ancestors all of the skills that they needed to survive. So they are firm believers in the clan way of life, and they uh, believe that they are part of that clan with and that animal is like their spirit animal almost, is what we would probably say today. Why did the Cherokee council houses have seven sides? This is Cherokee, not Seminole. Yes, because there's seven clans in the Cherokee. The Cherokee council houses had seven sides that represent each one of the seven clans. Why did the Cherokee group have two chiefs? What did they do? Yes, one of them ruled during peacetime, one of them ruled during times of war. So that's why they had two chiefs. Who was a sequoia? Uh, not a sequoia. Who was sequoia, that man? Who was he? And why was he considered important? Yes, he was a Cherokee. And he was important because he created the written language for the Cherokee nation. And he the Cherokee, he created a set of symbols. And the Cherokee is the only Native American tribe with a written language. That's why he was so important. Now you're going to go ahead and in Bright Thinker, there is a picture of a, of, it's a bear claw necklace. I can't share my screen with you. You'll have to open up your Bright Thinker to see it. It's colorful. It's beautiful. And then you're going to go ahead and answer some questions. And I did put them in there. Uh, there are five questions. What is this piece of art? Why do you think the long graceful pieces along the edge are? What do you think they are? I already told you what they were. What parts of the necklace can we not find in nature? Look at it closely. What do you think this necklace might indicate about the person who wore it? And would this necklace be valued and admired? Why or why not? Now, something I'm going to share with you about this necklace that you're going to look at here in a moment when you're done with this video is that only great chiefs were allowed to wear this necklace or warriors, great warriors. The necklace was believed to have very strong powers and only a man who had special spiritual rights was allowed to make it and, and oh, he could have it made for him. He did not. He did not make it. And he could have it endowed with the power to protect its owner. So if you were wearing this bear claw necklace, you, you were protected. You, as the owner of the necklace, you were protected. So, okay, that's pretty much what I have for you today. Tomorrow we'll come back and we'll take some notes on chapter six. And then on, oh, no, we don't have a checkpoint this week. It's a short week. So that's it. And then I'll be back on, so I'll be back tomorrow with notes on chapter six. You guys have a great day. Bye.